This week on the Writer's Detective Bureau. Inside Police Dispatch. Moving a morgue and getting investigative help from Ma Bell. I'm Adam Richardson, and this is the Writer's Detective Bureau. Welcome to episode 122 of the Writer's Detective Bureau, the podcast dedicated to helping authors and screenwriters write professional quality crime-related fiction. This week, I'm talking about how 911 calls get dispatched over the police radio, what would happen if the morgue becomes unusable, and how detectives worked with the phone company on investigations in the 1950s and 1960s. Now, let me see if this rings a bell. You're dedicated to mastering the craft of storytelling. You research police procedures like you're a doctoral student about to defend a thesis. You've put it all into a compelling story and finally took the scary leap of putting it out to the world, only to get a one-star review from some reader complaining about the scene where your heroine cocks back the hammer on her Glock. If you didn't know that Glocks don't have hammers then pay attention to me for just a second, because I've got you. If guns are not your thing, but one makes an appearance in your story, my Crime Fiction Guns course is for you. If you have never held a gun in your life, or the thought of walking into a gun store or gun range causes your heart to race, I have the solution. I created the Crime Fiction Guns online course as a safe place for crime fiction writers to learn everything you need to know about writing guns and ammunition into your stories without the politics or bravado of a wannabe middle-aged mutant ninja seal. The Crime Fiction Guns course is designed to really be a reference source that you can work through at your own pace and you will easily find whatever it is you're writing about time and time again. To learn more, visit crimefictionguns.com. Lori Sibley of lorisibley.com asks, is dispatch a cop or a civilian? How many people are working in this role at a time? Where are they located, at the police station or in a separate location? And if they're at a station, can a cop stop by and talk to a dispatcher in person? Are they kind of like a receptionist or more like a boss telling people where and what to do? Is dispatch the people who answer 911 calls, or are they specific people who communicate between the 911 call center and cops? Can cops talk directly to each other via their radios, or do they relay communication through dispatch? Let me start by saying that I have mad respect for dispatchers. It is insanely stressful and aggravating and heart-wrenching and PTSD-causing and by far one of the most demanding jobs in any department. That said, dispatch is one of those things that will look very different from agency to agency. A very small police department in a rural area or on a college campus even may have a single dispatch console where the dispatcher is also the secretary for the entire department. More often, though, dispatch is a dedicated call center where 911 calls for that jurisdiction come in and then the resources are then dispatched out. That could mean law enforcement, fire, ambulance, or all three of those at once. The vast majority of dispatchers are civilian. Uh, You may have an officer that's on light duty, like recouping from an injury working in dispatch, but that's usually a, that's pretty much a rarity. Most dispatch centers use CAD or computer aided dispatch now. So when a call to 911 comes in, that call is recorded and the call taker in the dispatch center um, or dispatcher tries to get as much relevant information about the call for service as possible from that caller. And they enter all of that info into the CAD system. Meanwhile, a dispatcher at a radio console will then dispatch the officer or fire engine or ambulance or whatever it is to that location and update the responding units on what's going on based upon what the call taker um, is adding to CAD. Now, I'm using the terms call taker and dispatcher kind of separately. Really, it's just kind of dividing the jobs of um, one person's answering the 911 call. The other one is dispatching on the radio, dispatching out those resources. Realistically, um, they are the same people. It's just that they're playing different roles in the call center. Some dispatch centers, especially ones that are handling EMS, emergency medical calls, they may coach callers 
um, the callers to the 911 on what to do while the fire engine and ambulance are on the way. So a dispatcher may walk the RP. RP is short for reporting party. Um, so they may walk the RP through starting CPR or prepping for childbirth or um, administering first aid, that kind of thing. Most agencies, assuming they have adequate staffing, will have dispatchers assigned to answer 911, while other dispatchers will be assigned to work specific radio channels. They may or may not switch roles throughout their workday, um, but they could. So uh, it's pretty common to spend a couple hours answering your 911 calls for like the first two hours of your shift, let's say, and then move over to the main police frequency for another few hours and then work a secondary police frequency. Um, where I work, we refer to that as an admin frequency for doing things like running license plates or driver's license status or checking for warrants or asking for a tow truck, that kind of thing. Keep in mind, though, that every single agency will set up their dispatch centers and how they use their radio frequencies completely differently. And even how they talk on the radio will change greatly. In fact, let's have a listen real quick to how LAPD dispatches this call, where you can tell how busy they are by how quickly this call comes out. Station is down 18849, 18849, unknown trouble, 146 East 94th Street, 146 East 94th Street, code 3, incident 2053, and RD 1822. She broadcasts that call in about 10 seconds, under 10 seconds, if you don't include the alert tones at the beginning, which LAPD uses to signify a code 3 call, a lights and siren call. So let's break down what she said real quick. Station is down 18849, 18849. She was even too quick for me at the very beginning there. I can't absolutely tell what she says at the very beginning. I think she says Southeast Units, uh, which is the area that this call is being dispatched to. Uh, but 18A49, 18A49 is her using the call sign of the unit she is assigning to the call. She's repeating it to get their attention. Um, 18 is the designator for units assigned to LAPD's Southeast area. So this is a Southeast area's units call um, based on the number 18 and the letter a Adam is the LAPD designation for a two officer car. A solo officer would be an L Lincoln. So 18 L 48 would be a solo officer. Uh, but this is 18 a 49. Um, just like 18 is the radio identifier for the Southeast area. One is the radio identifier for LAPD's central division or central area, as they call it now. So a two officer car assigned to central, we now know would have a call sign starting with one A or one Adam, just like officers Pete Malloy and Jim Reed working car one Adam 12. All units in the vicinity, officer needs help. 9226 Van Arden, shots fired. One Adam 12, handle code three. One Adam 12, roger. <laughs> Keep in mind, these letter designations are specific to LAPD. Where I work, an Adam unit is a solo car and a Lincoln unit is a lieutenant. Okay, so let's get back to our actual call. Unknown trouble, 146 East 94th Street, 146 East 94th Street. So our call type is unknown trouble. Unlike Adam 12, who had a shots fired call, this is an unknown trouble call. And we were given the address of 146 East 94th Street, and she repeats that twice. Code 3, incident 2053, and RD 1822. All right, so code 3 is respond with lights and siren. Incident 2053, that is the incident number in CAD, which we'll talk about here in just a second. And RD 1822, the reporting district, which is an area within... 18A49's beat, so it helps the officer know which part of their beat that they are headed toward, even though they have the address. So why did she give them the call number? Well, she's putting out the info as quickly as possible, and right now it's unknown trouble. They These officers don't know what they're walking into. It's a two-person car, so the officer that is um, riding shotgun, pardon the pun, um, <laughs> actually that's not a pun, that's quite literal, they're using that incident number or that call number to get more detail about the call by looking at their in-car computer. Um, so she gave them that call number in order to be able to look up incident 2053. When you're assigned to a call, your computer automatically pops that call up on your screen so you don't have to actually go hunting for it while you're driving. Um, but you can read the updates as the call taker adds them to the screen. 
LAPD is obviously a very big department and they have dispatch frequencies for each division. But when you have a busy city like that with literally thousands of officers, you can't tie up the radio with long transmissions, as we've just heard, right? Now compare how that call was dispatched to how this call came out by Aiken County Sheriff's Dispatch in South Carolina. Bravo 24 tsunami. Morning. Being that the 205 Circle K. Correct. So 205 Railroad Avenue, 205 Railroad Avenue in Wagner at the Circle K to meet with Jada Fillery. 303's on scene, and he's advising that she's needing to go to the 1100 block of Festival Trail Road to get her child back from her aunt's house, and the aunt is refusing to get the child back. Oh. Night and day, right? This call took nearly three times as long to dispatch, and it was not an emergency or priority call. This is actually a more common style of dispatching, where the dispatcher calls out the unit she's trying to reach, which was Bravo 24. And only after he responds with his call sign does she then dispatch the call. Most departments that I've encountered dispatch calls this way, where the dispatcher knows that the unit is actually listening to the radio. And once Bravo 24 does answer up, he gets a story of what the call was about rather than being told to look up the call. It's very possible that Bravo 24 doesn't have a computer in his car. Um, In fact, while I was listening to this frequency before hitting the record button, one of the other officers told dispatch to send and info to his phone rather than to his screen or in-car computer. We say send it to my screen or send it to my MDT where I work. Um, MDT or MDC meaning mobile data terminal or mobile digital computer. Either way, it's just a way to refer to the computer that's in your car. Okay, let's get back to Lori's other questions. Where is dispatch located? As with everything else, that really depends. It could be just inside the lobby of a police station. It could be in a basement of the station. It could be in its own building. Officers can and do and should (laughs) stop by dispatch. You would be amazed what an unsolicited Starbucks delivery can do to make your life so much easier. (laughs) Believe me, dispatch can make your work life of a living hell if you aren't careful. What do you mean I'm being dispatched to my 30th report today and it's not even in my beat? (laughs) And Lori, you asked, are they kind of like a receptionist or more like a boss telling people where and what to do? Well, they certainly think they're bosses. (laughs) I'm only kidding. You dispatchers that are listening, they are not shy about telling people I tell cops where to go. Uh, Technically, from a chain of command perspective, dispatch is not your boss as a patrol officer. They aren't even in your chain of command, but they certainly do control which calls you are going to. And that will have to do with the area that I'm assigned to, Uh, or it may have to do with my unit being the one closest to a priority call. Most police cars, if they have a computer in their car, will also have a vehicle locator or sergeant in the trunk, as I call it. Uh, So dispatch can see where all of their units are and CAD can automatically recommend the closest unit. So if I'm just clearing the jail, having finished booked someone in jail and I'm on my way back to my beat as a hot call comes out, I may get sent to that call because I'm close by, even if it isn't necessarily in the neighborhood that I'm assigned to patrol that day. And Lori's last dispatch related question was, can cops talk directly to each other via their radios or do they relay communication through dispatch? It depends. For the most part, yes, we can. But now we get into the technical aspects of how our radio systems work. If you think of the walkie talkie toys your kids probably play with, that's what we would call a line of sight or direct transmission. I key the mic button and talk, and it goes out over a singular radio frequency in the VHF or UHF band of frequencies. Then the other radio is listening on that same frequency, and you can hear me talking. Pretty simple stuff, right? So most VHF or UHF radios will have the ability to transmit or receive on a direct or talk around function, just like those toy walkie talkies. But that's not how the radios work when we're talking to dispatch. The primary way our radios work is through a series of repeaters. These repeaters are basically big antennas that repeat transmission over giant areas uh, and giving us a signal boost. And they're usually mounted at the tops of mountains or on really tall antennas in the city. But here's the thing. 
our radios, when they are in our normal repeater mode, not in direct or talk around mode like I just talked about, when they're in repeater mode, which is the way we keep our radios 99% of the time, they are receiving on one frequency and transmitting on another frequency. So when I key my microphone, I transmit, let's say, on 453.15 megahertz. And what I'm hearing from dispatch, I'm receiving on 453.55 megahertz. Now, keep in mind that as an officer, I don't know what megahertz these frequencies are. They're just channel one or channel two or six or whatever. But channel one, for instance, is transmit 453.15 and receive 453.55. And the reason for this is that when I transmit on 453.15, it's the repeater that's listening on that frequency that picks up the signal. And then that repeater, wait for it, repeats it on 453.55 for the rest of the city or county, and most importantly, dispatch to here. It's a pretty simple setup, and I'm slightly oversimplifying it here for my hams out there. Yes, I realize I'm ignoring peel tones and all that more technical stuff. Just keep in mind that with this setup, I can have my radio on repeat mode and talk to dispatch and also talk to my partner. Um, however, when I do that in repeat mode, I tie up the entire frequency and everyone in the city can hear me. If I switch from that repeat mode to a direct mode or a talk around mode, now direct and talk around are the same thing. It's just which brand of radio calls it what. Um, but when I'm on that direct or talk around mode, then I'm transmitting on the receive frequency, not on the frequency that the repeater and dispatch will pick up. So dispatch will not hear me. Um, and my transmission will only go as far as my little radio can send it, which is usually line of sight uh, and it's dependent upon the wattage so with my portable radio um, it's only a couple of watts my car has a little bit more wattage but it's nothing compared to what a proper repeater does so that repeater picks up that that low wattage transmission that i make and repeats it uh, at a much uh, more powerful scale now the big difference is as far as being able to talk to your partners is when you work for an agency that uses a trunked radio system like LAPD, where they have so many officers on the same frequency, even though they divide up the frequency by areas, but there are so many officers out there trying to talk at the same time that the radio system works more like a queuing system for transmissions. Almost like when you're standing in line at a bank and you've got your deposit slip in your hand, which in this case is your radio transmission, and you're waiting for the next available teller to open up, which in this case is a dispatcher. So since transmissions are queued and handed off, the system doesn't work in the same way as our simple VHF or UHF system that we first talked about. So for two officers to talk to each other on a call with a trunk system, uh, one of the officers may have to ask dispatch to open up a patch or to go to a separate tactical channel in order for the officers to be able to talk to each other and coordinate while working this call together. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, just remember that it can get more technical for the bigger agencies that have all the super whiz bang gigantic radio systems. Um, but the majority of the country is still on a pretty simple VHF or UHF system. For more on this, I recommend checking out radioreference.com. You can actually listen to live radio frequencies from around the world there. Uh, and if you really want to nerd out on the super technical radio stuff, check out ARRL.org, which is the Amateur Radio Relay League, which you may know as licensed ham radio operators. Did you know that ham radio operators can get involved as volunteers for emergency radio communications during natural disasters? That might be an interesting story prompt right there. Okay, that's probably that's definitely way more than you needed to know about radios, but I think I covered everything Lori asked. Lori also asked another question that I promise will not result in as long-winded an answer. <laughs> Lori asked, do you have to serve a search warrant to a specific person, or can you enter an empty house as long as you have a warrant in your hand? No. Yes. Search warrants are for places. Well, they can be for searching people too, but no, they do not have to be served upon a specific person. Yes, we can enter an empty house and serve the warrant. We just leave behind a copy of the warrant and a receipt of the items seized when we leave. 
I hope that answer was short enough. Thanks for all your questions, Lori. I know you have more questions, which I will be using in upcoming episodes. Before we get to our next question, I just need to quickly thank my Patreon patrons for supporting this show, especially my Gold Shield patrons, Deborah Dunbar from DebraDunbar.com, CeCe Jameson from CeCeJameson.com, Larry Keaton, Vicki Tharp of VickiTharp.com, Larry Darter, Natalie Borelli, Craig Kingsman of CraigKingsman.com, Lynn Vitale, Marco Carocari of MarcoCarocari.com, Rob Kearns of KnightsFallPress.com, Mariah Stone of MariahStone.com, Aurora Jacobson, and Kaylee for their support along with my Silver Cufflink and Coffee Club patrons. You can find links to all of the patrons supporting this episode in the show notes at writersdetective.com forward slash 122. To learn more about using Patreon to grow your author business or to support the show for as little as $2 per month, check out writersdetective.com forward slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Oh, we're already at the 20 minute mark. All right. Making up for lost time, giving you an extra long episode this time. All right. This week's next question comes from Kendra Coates, who writes, hello, Adam, my current work in progress has a character who works as a security guard on the night shift at my created city's medical examiner's office building. A couple of idiots drove their SUV into the lobby while my character was on shift and she called the police and apprehended the idiots as the police were arriving. Besides the police investigation as to why the idiots decided to ram into the building, what would happen? The idiots did not get further than the lobby into the building, so no bodies in the morgue or stored evidence or personal items in the offices were disturbed. I'm plotting that my security guard character has to stay home until the police have cleared her in the investigation, but I'm curious as to what should the medical examiner office do? Move locations? Or if the building is deemed structurally sound, just board up the lobby and keep working out of it until the city gets around to fixing it? Thanks in advance. Thanks for the questions, Kendra. The police would certainly do their investigation, and whether that's a simple traffic accident investigation, a DUI or DWI, depending on what state your story is set in, or an intentional ramming for some other nefarious purpose, all of that would depend on what the cops found that steers them pardon the pun, (laughs) one way or another in the investigation. Unless there is some obvious connection between the security guard and the idiots, I don't see why the guard would be sent home. If there was an issue, it would be more likely that the guard would just be assigned to another location by the security company, um, basically swapping work sites around and have another security guard take over working at the morgue, if that seemed to be an issue. If the guard was injured in the crash, however, that would be a more plausible reason to keep her at home. If the building remains sound, the ME probably would keep on doing business as usual. If the morgue itself were damaged, they would certainly move out of the building. Most medical examiner's offices or coroner's offices, depending on the location, have a plan for storing bodies in mass, like a mass casualty incident, like a plane crash or a natural disaster, where you may have dozens or even hundreds of bodies to deal with. One realistic scenario is for refrigeration trucks to come in, like big 18-wheeler semi-trucks, to act as emergency storage. Here in California, I've actually met the state level coordinator that we would call to make that happen if that happened in our jurisdiction. So if the medical examiner's office in your story is small, they might just move the few bodies that they have to the morgue at the local hospital. And by the way, most hospitals do have morgues. It may not be the morgue for the county, like for the coroner or the medical examiner, but they will very likely have cold storage for bodies. And your medical examiner's office might be able to use the hospital as a temporary morgue as well. And we'll wrap things up with our last question, which comes from Joseph Anderson, who writes, Hi, Adam. Do you know when the phone companies began keeping records of calls made that could be obtained for evidence? I have a legal drama set in the late 1950s and wanted to verify it as around then. Thanks, Joseph Anderson. Great question, Joseph. And ironically, I know the answer to this question. It's my understanding that phone records started once the switching became automated in the mid to late 1960s. So that's not necessarily going to help you with your late 1950s. 
whether it was 1950s or 1960s, this was before my time. However, (laughs) I had a cold case that was from the mid 1960s and operators still hand connected every call. This would have been back when phone numbers consisted of a three letter exchange followed by four numbers. The reason I learned this from the cold case was because in my case that I had, it predated the 1968 Omnibus Crime Control Act, which established Title III wiretap law. In my cold case, the detectives back then did not legally need a wiretap to learn what was said on a phone line. The detectives simply sent a written request to Ma Bell, the phone company, asking for the operators to listen in on any phone calls connected to the target phone number and to take notes on what was said. And then those notes were then forwarded to the detectives. So while there weren't any phone records back then, there were likely a handful of operators that could be interviewed about any phone calls they may have remembered connecting and possibly listening in on. So I hope this helps stoke your imagination. Thanks so much for listening this week and sticking around to the end. (laughs) This show is powered by your questions. Send them to me by going to writersdetective.com forward slash podcast. Thanks again for listening. Have a great week and write well.